appreciate all of you taking some time to talk about this topic, which uh, quite frankly is not a new topic. I, there were people who protested textiles back in the early 19th, 19th century, you might recall. Uh, but it, it could barely be uh, a more current topic, right? So, you know, we see books such as uh, our friends Eric Brynjolfsson and er Andy McAfee writing The, the Second Machine Age. Uh, David O'Tour just uh, uh, presented a paper at the uh, Fed Jackson Hole uh, conference just last week. Uh, and then actually the, the Pew Research folks, uh, an eminent research um, uh, group, just recently re released a poll um, that they interviewed a number of experts uh, in technology, some of whom I believe are actually in the room. Uh, and, and the results were quite uh, interesting. Uh, about f it was about 50-50, it was 48-52, as to whether or not robots and, and uh, artificial intelligence would actually displace a significant number of jobs uh, by 2025. So uh, obviously it's a, it's a very current topic. I always like to start with this wonderful line from William Gibson, the science fiction writer. He said, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. So. You know, yes, there's all kinds of science fiction things that we can imagine in the future, but we can also just look around and see what is happening today and then just extrapolate forward. So I actually think if you look at most of the automation, it comes down to um, man-machine combinations. And all productivity mm -hmm. does mean that each person, when you have productivity increases, each person is doing more, and so therefore the unit of number of people to do this amount of work goes down, right? But that then creates resources for doing other work. I mean, the, the, the most simple one was the transformation from an agricultural economy, right? We used to have a huge percentage. 41%, yeah. I think, of yeah. employment, right? Yeah, was, was making food, and now it's like under two, right? And so, uh, and, and, and then they say, well, what happens with those 40% of the population? Well, they go on to other jobs. Now, the, whole ur the reason why this topic is urgent is, well, okay, does the exponentiating, uh, you know, Moore's law change the rule or not? Uh, there's always painful dislocation. Can we make that pain a lot less? Can we make this time cycle shorter? I want to share an example. Um, one of the things I learned from a recent uh, trip to Shenzhen, uh, because it's, it's one of the most interesting manufacturing hubs, and one of the things I was, uh, was stunned by in, the, in looking at the most advanced factor, we went to uh, Huawei uh, doing the manufacturing. And I was expecting, as kind of a Silicon Valley technologist, that it was kind of like a complete line of robots. Right, it was like they would, the whole thing would be automated because that would obviously be the thing to do. Roughly about 60% of it was automated and 40% of it was still people. Like, and, and it's all a question of, of, of choice. You say, well, is that just because low cost? No, no. These are actually high paid, high skill jobs. And the answer is, is actually in, because in the future, it's uh, adaptability is key and people are more adaptable. So when they set up the machine line and it's all machine, it's actually a huge amount of retooling to shift it from line one to line two, whereas the people are much more easy to shift. If you look at this idea that it's a combination of man and machine, and you look at some of the examples that have really kind of surprised us uh, in just how they've taken off, like Uber, uh, like the Apple store, you know, they are actually cases where the humans are adding, you know, are, are made more powerful by their you know, this, this background, and that creates a better customer experience, which creates new demand. I think ultimately, uh, you know, we are going to be focused on making better experiences for consumers, and that will not necessarily be automatable. When we say we want to create jobs, it takes away agency. You know, it's this notion that somebody has this thing, and I will hire you, and you will work for the man, you know, that whole cultural, uh, you know, ideal, uh, you know, is, is an artifact. It's not written in stone. I think the optimistic scenario is, as uh, Tim was describing, is that we don't just have also a creation of new industries and new jobs, which is essentially kind of, you know, uh, full-time salary work, but also have the creation of a lot of different economic opportunities where people can be micro-entrepreneurs, they can do all sorts of things, and that we can facilitate, because we're in a networked age, a faster ability to have that invention, to scale up and double down on the inventions that actually work, and therefore the notion of the kind of very painful dislocations, because you know the whole move from the agricultural age to the industrial age actually came with a super amount of pain, too. The pessimistic scenario is, roughly speaking, if you, you know, begin to get a broad number of, essentially, we have a serious youth unemployment today uh, problem, and so we have yet to have that be hitting there. And a large percentage of unemployed youth that don't view they have a future usually leads to some form of civil instability. 
Uh, and so uh, you know, that civil in instability can co compound and could create reactions that then actually block out the optimistic future. We're privileged to be joined by uh, another set of eminent guests, including uh, four eminent uh, economists and, and two other uh, thought leaders um, uh, from our local communities. We have a deep uh, kind of risk-taking culture, a lot of institutions about how markets work, especially capital markets, and a lot of public policies that, uh, that have supported job creation in America. Um, my hope wavers a little bit if I add the adjective good jobs, and our panelists have already picked up on that, and I think that's a really important question. Um, we see evidence, it's quite clear in the US in recent years, that we're not creating enough good jobs. And so it's a question of do people have jobs, but people care a lot about their W-2s, what incomes are they earning? If you segment it by educational attainment, since 2000, 96.2% uh, of the US workforce since 2000 are in educational cohorts whose total money earnings, inflation adjusted, have been falling, not rising. That includes even people with a four-year college degree and non-professional advanced degrees. Uh, the only ones that have been rising are the PhDs on average, and then the professional degrees of the doctors, the lawyers, and the MBAs. So that's a little sobering if you think about it. We're going to create good jobs. And a big open question that we'll probably talk about, and, and our panelists already rightly pointed to it, I think, is public policies. So I uh, am with Matt on this. I said when I heard the question that I didn't think the formulation was correct because we live in a market economy. Uh, supply and demand ultimately determine the level of employment. Uh, so the number of jobs will be created, but the quality of jobs is a huge question, I think. What's happening with the technology, which is skill biased and labor saving, is it's eliminating middle income jobs. It is complementary to the high skills in this room. So we all have jobs, and the jobs are high income jobs because some smart people have to work with the technology. But there is a, a very large number of people who are being pushed down into uh, lower income jobs. The second thing that's really important, it's been with us for a long time, is the growing gap between productivity and wages. And you can see that in the gap between the productivity, a measure of the bounty of brilliant machines, and how it's being distributed in terms of wages. If we had an inflation-adjusted, productivity-adjusted minimum wage today, it would be like $25. It would, we would not be arguing about $10. Public policy is, if anything, moving backwards. It's certainly not moving forward at the level of the race. So the policymakers lose the race, and a lot of displaced workers, a lot of American families lose the race. And that is my concern. Uh, let me e end by saying that one thing I begin to think about, I think it's important for all of us to think about. So we're talking about machines. Machines displacing people. Machines changing the ways in which people work. Who owns the machines? Who should own the machines? Perhaps what we need to think about is the way in which the workers who are working with the machines are part owners of the machines. So what we're going to see is automation. Um, right now, manufacturing is trickling back to the United States. It's not rushing back because of the infrastructure costs, because of the, uh, the difficulty in retraining a workforce. Give it five or seven years, and that trickle becomes a flood. Give it 15 years, and now we have the robots going out on strike saying, stop the 3D printers. They're taking our jobs away. <laughs> because everywhere you go, you're talking about decimation, decimation, decimation. We cannot retain the workforce. But no one can answer the question. Uh, without doubt, there are no jobs. Now, what are the solutions? We can discuss that. Today, take any field, biotech, infotech, nanotech, energy, healthcare, education. Everyone right now is wide open to revolutionary transformational developments. Uh, the, the only limitation we have is our ability to exploit them. That's the only limitation we have. Maybe we're looking at the wrong symptoms as opposed to looking at the fundamentals, which is that we are not innovating at the speed of the economy. We are not adapting fast enough. But just about everything you can imagine can be automated. Most of the jobs, even in this room, eventually will be automated. So you know, what does that world look like? It's hard to know. But in the short term, the number of opportunities we have in America is unprecedented. One problem is education. The good news is, again, technology is beginning to create curricula that can transform education. Uh, I was struck recently by uh, learning that uh, in, in one of our largest banks, the turnover rate for bank tellers is 50% a year. So being a bank teller now is no longer a sort of skilled job. It's no longer really a well-paid job. 
So we've had this change in technology. Obviously, we've put a lot of the intelligence into the, the IT system, so we don't need uh, such skilled uh, bank tellers, although if you ever go to inside the bank, I try not to, but if you ever go inside the bank, uh, you sort of uh, long for the days when the, the bank teller was more skilled. But anyway, the banks obviously have decided, as have Walmart and, and many, many other companies, um, that it's um, more cost effective to use uh, workers that don't have much training, um, that uh, probably don't have a lot of uh, education, although I think training is the more important uh, but instead to build into the production system uh, the productivity, and they're very good at that, um, but it does create a huge number of uh, not very good jobs together with a set of um, jobs, the conceptualizers, the people that can take advantage of the technology um, that have high incomes. So this has obviously created a problem of inequality in our society, but also we're seeing that, that people who cannot get or you know, don't have the gumption to get, you can go both ways on this, uh, a good job, are actually deciding not to work at all. So they're ending up uh, unemployed, they're ending up on disability, they're ending up leaving the labor force. Maybe there's a way we can have a technological initiative um, that could think about how we could change or adapt. I mean, we're not gonna, we're not gonna take the technology from this direction to that direction to change the direction of technology so that it is um, more friendly, more, more uh, complementary with the mass of workers that we have uh, that are currently not benefiting uh, from that, that, that technology. If workers that have been consigned to lousy jobs suddenly see new opportunities opening to them, then I think there's more motivation and, and they are much more willing to seek out uh, the skills. The most rapidly growing category of jobs in this <clears throat> large stub of, uh, of occupations that the uh, Department of Labor records was other. That is to say, categories that were not big enough yet to uh, warrant their own line. And then, of course, under other, they did have some nascent industries identified there, and the most rapidly growing category of jobs in the U.S. economy over the period covered was other, other. <laughs> and uh, what people forget is that when there are innovations that uh, destroy jobs, and as I say, we've been doing that for at least two centuries, we starting in Britain, maybe two and a half centuries, um, uh, incomes are created for somebody else. And to close the logical circle, you have to ask what happens to those incomes. It's a very important part of the process. And the incomes may be spent, but if they're going to be spent, they have to be spent on something. And that something creates new jobs. We may not know what they are ahead of time, but that something creates jobs. And where the private market uh, won't do it, and there are lots of mechanisms in the private market that contribute to creating new jobs, but where they don't create adequate new jobs, then we can do it through monetary and fiscal policy. That's how we close the, uh, the logical loop.